Mr. President, I ask the question, as I have for several weeks now, why are we here? What I hear from my constituents in Delaware, as I heard earlier today, an event at Westside Health, why is this Senate in session now, in the midst of a nationwide pandemic, focusing on rushing through a nominee for the United States Supreme Court rather than doing everything we can to work across the aisle to craft a solution to the problems, the crises facing our nation. Tens of millions of Americans unemployed. Hundreds of thousands of businesses permanently closed. Schools all over the country either not yet open or just barely open. And thousands upon thousands of Americans who died alone in pain uncomforted by family, uncertain of how they came to be in this place, uncared for by their country. Eight and a half million infected, 220,000 or more dead. We are in the middle of a tragic pandemic and a recession made worse by our president's bungled mishandling of that pandemic. And instead of coming together and providing the relief that all of our states, all of our people are calling for. We are doing this. We are doing this. Instead, my Republican colleagues are walking over a dangerous precipice. They're doing something that, according to Chairman Graham of the Senate Judiciary Committee, was unthinkable just two years ago. In the last 10 days before a presidential election, in the last month, before a presidential election, they are ramming through for a lifetime appointment to the Supreme Court, President Trump's nominee. In a rushed and partisan process in the midst of an ongoing presidential election. Why? Why are we here and why are they doing this? I've heard a lot of talk from my colleagues on the Judiciary Committee and here on the floor about justices and how they're not policy makers, that they are distinct from politics, about abstract methodological terms and ideas like originalism and textualism, about judges and justices as neutral arbiters whose decisions couldn't possibly be predicted. But you don't work this hard to confirm a Supreme Court justice in the middle of a pandemic while a majority of American states are voting and tens of millions have voted while well, Election Day is just eight days away, and a third of us are up for election because you care most about abstract ideas or neutral principles. You don't go against your own promise, your own promise, after you've claimed as a matter of high principle justices shouldn't be confirmed during presidential elections, and after you blocked a highly qualified nominee for exactly that reason because you care most about neutral arbiters and judicial methodology. No, this race to fill this seat is about power. It is about political power. It is about knowing the American people have turned against the president, especially because of his failed, flawed, ultimately disastrous response to this pandemic. We are not turning the corner, as he declared just this week. We have a record high number of cases in dozens of states, an outbreak uncontrolled, unmanaged, and leadership uncaring. My colleagues know the election is upon us. Many are up for re-election. And so when Justice Ginsburg tragically passed away just a few weeks ago, President Trump and my colleagues saw one last opportunity, one last chance to decide the balance of the Supreme Court, not just for a year or a term, but for decades to come, and to entrench a hard right majority whose views are far outside the American mainstream. As my Democratic colleagues and I have been laying out on the Judiciary Committee and in speeches here on this floor, that hard right turn will have lasting, serious, significant, even devastating consequences for the American people. And after digging into and studying Judge Barrett's record as a law professor, as a judge, 
her writings, her speeches, her opinions, I am convinced that she will come to the Supreme Court with both a deeply conservative originalist philosophy in the style of Justice Scalia and a judicial activism even further to the right that will put at risk long-standing rights the American people hold dear in nearly every aspect of our modern lives. Simply put, Judge Barrett as Justice Barrett, I am convinced, will open a new chapter of conservative judicial activism unlike anything we've seen. Why would I think this? First, Judge Barrett was handpicked by President Trump after he made clear he wants a new justice to overturn the Affordable Care Act with potentially catastrophic consequences for a majority of Americans protected by the ACA. Everyone watching at home has heard my colleagues say for the last decade their top priority is repealing the Affordable Care Act. Every Republican senator on the committee talked publicly, repeatedly, about their desire to get rid of the law, and they have voted that way. So has our president. But despite their best efforts, he and my Republican colleagues failed to get the votes here on the floor of the United States Senate. So now they're taking their last best shot at overturning the ACA and trying to do it through the Supreme Court. This is where Judge Barrett comes in. As she admitted during my questioning, Judge Barrett has written in no uncertain terms. She thinks Chief Justice Roberts got it wrong in his ruling eight years ago, upholding the ACA against constitutional challenge. She wrote this article just three years ago in 2017, and soon thereafter found herself on President Trump's shortlist for the Supreme Court. Meanwhile, the Justice Department, under President Trump's leadership, has joined the challenge to the ACA now back in front of the Supreme Court. And that will be heard by the court just one week from the election, two weeks from today, tomorrow. President Trump and his administration are arguing in no uncertain terms, the court must get rid of the entire ACA. Now, my Republican colleagues have said this is fear-mongering. This is a different case and a different issue. But to anyone who thinks this characterization of this challenge is far-fetched, just read the brief. Read the brief filed by the Solicitor General of the United States or the brief signed and co-signed by 18 Republican State Attorneys General. President Trump himself lashed out at Chief Justice Roberts over and over again for upholding the Affordable Care Act and its protections for a majority of Americans, and he pledged as candidate Trump his nominees would do the right thing and overturn the law. And here, in the last minute of the last act of the Trump show, he may at long last have his chance. But it isn't just the Affordable Care Act that's on President Trump's Supreme Court agenda. He made clear he wants a nominee to do three things. Overturn the ACA, overturn Roe versus Wade, and perhaps most chillingly for the future of our democracy, hand him the election if there is a dispute in the courts that makes its way to the Supreme Court. On that second point about overturning Roe, Judge Barrett steadfastly refused to say whether she thought Roe was correctly decided because it is the subject of legislation, of litigation, currently contested. But she refused to say, as well, whether the foundational case, Griswold versus Connecticut, decided 55 years ago that protects the right to privacy, the right to use contraceptives by a married family in the privacy of their own home. She refused to say whether that was right. And in the recent past, even indisputably conservative nominees, nominees chosen by Republican presidents such as Chief Justice Roberts and Justices Alito and Kavanaugh have said, of course, Griswold was rightly decided, is settled precedent. So I found Judge Barrett's hesitation, even refusal to say so, chilling. More broadly, and this is important, Judge Barrett's approach to precedent itself suggests she will lead the way in reversing longstanding cases upon which our rights rely. Precedent's been called the foundation stone of law. Precedent protects the rights and freedoms that many Americans rely on today. 
the right to be safe in your home from government intrusion, the right to marry whomever you love, <coughs> the right to control your own body. But I've come away convinced that Judge Barrett, if confirmed to the court, would be even more willing than Justice Scalia to overturn those precedents with which she disagrees. And this is rooted in things that she has written and said as a law professor and a judge. She's made clear judges and justices should feel free to overturn cases they believe were wrongly decided, regardless of how many people have ordered their lives around those decisions and have come to rely on them. She even said that those with her conservative originalist philosophy have abandoned a commitment to judicial restraint. As I made clear in my questioning, the cases that could be in jeopardy with a Justice Barrett on the Supreme Court cover a vast range of issues. Issues which together affect hundreds of millions of Americans' lives, from health care to education to consumer protection to marriage equality to criminal justice. In the past several decades, the Supreme Court decided more than 120 cases by a five to four margin with Justice Ginsburg in the majority and Justice Scalia in the dissent. So just as a matter of analysis, just to help folks see the scope and reach of the consequences of the decision to be made here tonight, we looked at what would happen if Justice Ginsburg in the majority were replaced by somebody with Justice Scalia's philosophy or farther right. These cases include not only the key ruling on the Affordable Care Act, NFIB versus Sebelius, but also Obergefell versus Hodges, which upheld, based on that privacy jurisprudence that started all the way back in Griswold, upheld the idea that marriage equality is the rule of the land. Grutter versus Bollinger, which upheld race-conscious admissions policies at universities. Tennessee versus Lane, which held state governments must comply with the Americans with Disabilities Act. Arizona State Legislature versus Arizona Independent Redistricting Commission, which upheld the constitutionality of nonpartisan redistricting. Massachusetts versus EPA, which allows the EPA to regulate greenhouse gases, and Roper v. Simmons, which prohibits executing people for crimes committed while they were children. Think about the scope and reach of it. Cases that touch labor rights to Native American rights, consumer rights to environmental protection. Yes, our comments on the floor and in the committee focused on the Affordable Care Act. They focused on reproductive rights and privacy. But the scope and reach of the consequences are breathtaking. Even to this day, I fear that we as a nation have not fully reckoned with the impact that a six to three conservative court will have on so many aspects of our lives. As to President Trump's third demand, that a justice chosen by him help decide the election, I was deeply dismayed to hear Judge Barrett refuse to commit to recusing herself from any case involving an election dispute. President Trump is the reason I asked that question. President Trump himself is actively undermining the integrity of our election. He's spreading baseless rumors about voter fraud, encouraging voter suppression, engaging in a disinformation campaign so egregious it's hard to believe it could be coming from an American, let alone an American president. His statements have been so indefensible that when my colleagues asked Judge Barrett whether the president should commit to conducting a peaceful transition of power if he loses an election, a question, an obvious no-brainer, a matter of basic civics, Judge Barrett said she couldn't respond because President Trump's statements have turned this fundamental tenet of our democracy into a partisan political question. Before now, to my knowledge, no president has ever demanded that his nominee to a Supreme Court case, to a Supreme Court seat be rushed through so that that justice, that ninth justice, could look at the ballots, as he has said, and hand him an election. And never in our history 
as the United States Senate confirmed a Supreme Court justice in circumstances like these just eight days before a final election date in an ongoing presidential election. So at the very, very least, given President Trump's unprecedented, overreaching, inappropriate comments about the election and her nomination, I asked Judge Barrett that she would recuse herself in the event of an election dispute. To be clear, nothing is stopping her from making that commitment, and she would not do so. Recent events have made clear this issue is anything but hypothetical. Just last week, the U.S. Supreme Court divided four to four, four to four, on a question arising from Pennsylvania and came to the brink of adopting a novel, even radical theory advanced by Republicans in Pennsylvania that would empower the Supreme Court to override a state Supreme Court's interpretation of their own state laws and constitution in a way that would disenfranchise thousands of voters. A new Justice Barrett joining that court could well provide the fifth vote in support of this outrageous theory, which her mentor Justice Scalia accepted in Bush v. Gore. And to no one's surprise, the Pennsylvania Republican Party is again preparing to file in the Supreme Court a renewed claim. In light of this conflict of interest, in light of the appearance of bias, her involvement in this case could have lasting, negative, devastating consequences for the independence of the court and our democracy. So I urge my Republican colleagues to consider before voting to confirm tonight the very real impacts their actions will have, not only on millions of our constituents, but on our democracy and this institution itself. As for me, I will be voting no on the confirmation of Judge Barrett to the United States Supreme Court. Thank you, Mr. President. With that, I yield the floor.